on. So, uh, welcome, uh, good afternoon or good morning for those of you joining us from uh, Central Europe. Uh, this is the third session in the first webinar series of the Kebab project. Uh, Kebab is a knowledge alliance uh, a, which is part of the Erasmus Plus program. It is funded by the Erasmus Plus. Uh, it stands for uh, Knowledge Alliance for Evidence-Based Urban Practices. Uh, the seminar webinar today is integrated with uh, one of our courses. Um, I should introduce myself. I am Ilaria Geddes. I work in the Department of Architecture at the University of Cyprus. Um, the University of Cyprus is coordinating the Kebab project. And um, the webinar is integrated uh, with one of our courses, as I said, it's uh, the research methodologies course, uh, research methodologies for architecture and urban design. So the students uh, from that course are attending uh, the lecture today as part of their uh, normal uh, regular classes. And this is something that we try uh, to do in the Kebab project, uh, is to integrate the project activities with uh, existing courses and other activities in the participant uh, institutions. Um, the first session uh, today, uh, we have two speakers from the University of Parma, uh, Barbara Gerry, who is an assistant professor in architectural engineering, and Marco Maretto, who is an associate professor of architecture and uh, urban design. And they're gonna to talk to us about uh, climate sensitive uh, design and environmental outdoor uh, evaluation. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, you can share your screen. And okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ilaria. Thank you all for the uh, for this very uh, interesting invitation. And uh, well, I think uh, um, if uh, Barbara agree, we can start <coughs> our presentation because uh, it's the time is not so much and the things to say are a lot. Yes, just can a second. You see it? Yeah. Okay. No. No. Yes, okay, okay. No, 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 I see a fun, we see, I think we see a fantastic colored desktop. No, I, I'll try once more. No, no. I think you have two screens. Yeah. Yes, yeah, now, yes. Okay. Okay now? Yes. Great. Very good. So uh, let's start then um, talking about this climate sensitive urban design and environmental outdoor evaluation. Uh, well, at the base of this uh, um, communication is, of course, the uh, awareness that urban design, contemporary urban design, and um, environmental design are uh, by now the two faces of the same coin. It's not possible anymore to think about urban projects without to think about their environmental um, effect. And actually, we would say what we believe strongly is that the uh, urban design and the uh, environmental urban design actually are really just one uh, multiple rich uh, tool to be, um, to be addressed. Also because we, it, that's what we can do for the future. And also because uh, it is possible to address an, an, an sustainable or a, an environmental urban design moving from the outdoor evaluation, from the environmental outdoor evaluation. Because as it is from the open spaces that we can read, we can analyze the city and actually we can design the city itself. Also because it is on the open spaces, in the open spaces, then we can make experience of the city that we can leave the city not just because we can meet each other and talk each other, but also because it's the place from which we can use even the physical aspects of the uh, of a city. It's the place where immaterial and material aspects of a city uh, actually live and merge uh, together. 
that is why we, we, we decided to focus on these aspects we, we think particularly important for contemporary urban design. Um, we can see here a small agenda what we are going to present today. Uh, we are going to uh, have a short introduction about the cities and the, uh, urban morphology. Then we move to uh, some example uh, of a good urban design practice and not so good as we see in a few minutes. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, outdoor comfort uh, um, by methods and instruments. Uh, then we move to uh, um, a, a sort of method Mark and I uh, have been uh, testing uh, since uh, basically 10 years uh, in early stage environmental modeling. And uh, eventually we are going to present some tools for climate based urban design. So let's start from the beginning. Um, we all know that encouraging citizens to take over of outdoor spaces is a very actual issue, and it involves municipalities, urban planners and architects. Their work is especially focused on proper interventions to upgrade and improve shared urban areas, in addition to increase the city's value and outdoor reliability. Today, uh, almost every building is designed with the so-called environmental simulation tools, the ESTS, we are going to, to talk about this, and sustainability and its implementation um, by uh, simulation tools can be applied not, also, not only to define and to optimize the shape of buildings, but also to uh, focus on the shape of city and its neighborhoods. The last 20 years clearly show more frequency of extreme weather conditions with an increased summer heat waves in certain Europe. This is particularly evident in metropolitan cities as the effect is intensified by the contribution of the very famous urban heat iron effect, the UHI. So increasing the global uh, awareness of climate change and its negative impacts uh, increased a lot the pressure uh, on architects, uh, but also municipalities to integrate these consideration into the design uh, processes. Digital tools are already the primary vehicle for developing design concept and for producing architecture. Uh, that uh, they also uh, have been uh, recently uh, become a vehicle for interdisciplinary collaboration, um, which has introduced a, a large uh, variety of tools, uh, which bridge sectors of knowledge that have been traditionally very fragmented so far. These new tools and the recent studies which help validate them make it possible to anticipate and optimize the performance of design before it is built. So this offers a, a very interesting opportunity for us uh, for integrating environmental evaluation uh, into the very early design phases for uh, urban design. Uh, and this is considered a very profound change uh, with implication at many, many scales uh, from industrial products to building materials uh, to uh, neighborhoods and master plans uh, practices. So um, let's, move, let's start from this, uh, uh, some examples of climate-based project in urban design practice. The very first project we would like to present to you uh, is, the, uh, master uh, is the master plan for the University of uh, Cincinnati in the United States. The project has been developed by the famous firm uh, Hergraves and Associates uh, that worked with the University of Cincinnati uh, for the development of uh, this uh, master plan. Um, the goal uh, was to uh, transform uh, this campus uh, from a commuter campus that was uh, historically dominated by roads, uh, parking lots, uh, to a, a pedestrian oriented campus with new buildings, uh, um, open spaces, uh, because the aim was to create a dynamic campus uh, with the main focus of uh, promotes the quality of uh, uh, students' life. 
Here we can see the master plan. Hergraves uh, work on uh, this uh, 12 acre site redevelopment um, with the, the collaboration of the University of Cincinnati uh, to the so called um, Green Campus. Uh, this project involves uh, uh, a very uh, large redevelopment of the ground level asphalt parking lots that was transformed in a large variety of green spaces that includes, as you can see, open lawns, uh, works, sculpture areas, fountains, and um, the design. Uh, included special features um, which were uh, supported by microclimatic uh, assessment uh, to support the green space design. Uh, we can see uh, a lot of uh, hills, uh, works, uh, water funnels, uh, pathways, uh, uh, seating areas, uh, uh, green spaces, uh, uh, and many, many spaces uh, uh, always focused on uh, citizens, users and students' uh, livability. The master planning strategy is uh, based on a series of uh, connections. Um, the aim was uh, to emphasize, uh, to focus on the pattern of uh, historic uh, uh, quadrangles of the historical uh, university. Mm, but the idea is uh, to connect with the main street, as you can see over here, the historical buildings with the stadium uh, and the other buildings for the faculties and uh, for the departments. Campus Green in Cincinnati was transformed uh, in, from a large asphalt uh, parking lot into open lawns, uh, lawns gardens, uh, as well as a, a large arboretum. Uh, the circulation systems uh, was uh, um, in-depth uh, studies uh, studied uh, to um, enlarge and to merge the potentiality of green areas, permeable, permeable uh, zones, um, and the green serves as a common space for a large variety of uh, uses. Here we can see the main street uh, with different uh, uh, quotes, with different uh, um, permeable surfaces, uh, um, as well as uh, uh, the pedestrian uh, pathways. In uh, these uh, uh, very uh, attractive uh, images, uh, we can see one of the main entrance of the new uh, campus. The idea is to uh, prevent some uh, uh, dangerous and harmful, harmful effect uh, derived uh, uh, from the winds. Um, so uh, the idea of her graves uh, it was to build this large uh, cone-shaped hill to uh, protect the, the, the users from the uh, unwanted wind, uh, especially during uh, the winter time. Here we can see uh, from above uh, the great uh, system of pathways uh, for, uh, for students and for faculty members that connect uh, the entrance with the main, uh, the main street here uh, at, the, um, at the end of the pictures. As we said before, uh, the microclimatic analysis, the evaluation uh, mainly focused on the local features uh, uh, when we talk about winds, uh, winds directions, uh, uh, main temperatures, uh, irradiation, and all these studies uh, are focused on uh, leverage and merge the potentialities of the local uh, microclimates. Uh, on, uh, on the left, we can see uh, another uh, cone uh, shape hill that uh, aims, that um, acts like a wind barrier. Uh, and on the right, we can see uh, the path that connects uh, the, the main entrance to the uh, main street. Um, a great attention was dedicated to the disposition of vegetation, of trees, uh, because uh, uh, the previous campus uh, uh, design uh, presents a general lack of evergreen trees. Um, the 
the architects uh, wants strongly to uh, focus on the potentialities of trees for shading and to uh, cast shadows, especially on the historical facades of the university buildings uh, to reduce the energy demand and to um, create a pleasant uh, area for the students to sit uh, nearby. So they choose a specific uh, type of plant uh, to, um, to be act in a way that act uh, like shading elements. Another attention was dedicated to uh, the potentialities of the urban canopy to uh, cover some unpleasant uh, uh, building facades like this one uh, that uh, was not very um, pleasant uh, in, the, uh, in the campus uh, uh, overview. Um, the same project uh, um, times at uh, define some uh, uh, benches or uh, seating areas uh, differentiating uh, between uh, uh, permeable surfaces like here on the right with the um, semi permeable surfaces uh, on on the left Great attention was also dedicated to uh, campus lighting. Uh, the idea is uh, to uh, place in the right uh, position uh, both uh, the street lamps and uh, the, the green masses. The idea is to uh, prevent the um, green canopy, the tree canopy to cover uh, the street lamps. Uh, this is a very uh, smart uh, design since uh, uh, when the, the trees uh, would be uh, at the very uh, large, uh, when we when when they uh, would uh, um, get bigger, uh, the risk is uh, uh, to uh, cover the street lamp. So the maintenance in this way uh, will be reduced at the minimum. This is uh, uh, the, uh, another uh, path to get to the building, uh, the university department. Uh, the Hergrave uh, and Associate um, dedicated some uh, uh, shading studies, uh, preliminary studies to uh, detect the potential uh, harmful situation uh, related to uh, Mm, shading and non-shaded area, so they uh, try to put these uh, overhanging structures uh, uh, to connect uh, the building uh, to the parking, uh, the bike parking here uh, near the, the street. So this is, a, uh, we think, a great example of a microclimatic design uh, with a very smart solutions. Uh, we can Call, it, call them a nature-based solution um, that Hergraves uh, uh, applied for the uh, campus of Cincinnati. And, uh, but sometimes things go wrong. And so we see once again the importance of a climate-based project. Um, and we see how it, does, it is not enough to involve uh, huge firms, firms in architecture or landscape design or huge technicians. Uh, we understand so at the end of the, we will see how at the end of the day, um, a proper awareness in uh, analyzing and uh, uh, climate based uh, design is really needed. So we moved from USA to Europe, we are now in London, and we can see uh, the unfamous walkie-talkie building. Uh, it was completed in uh, uh, 2040 by the uh, architect Vignoli, who admitted he knew the facade of his uh, uh, curvy skyscraper would focus an intense beam of sunlight into a neighboring street, but he didn't realize it was going to be so hot, so harmful. So let's see what happened on the very last summer days in 2014. 
Uh, as we can see, uh, an harmful uh, sunbeam reflected by the curvy south facade of the skyscraper um, literally melted down a uh, Jaguar car uh, windows, uh, uh, as we can see. Vignoli said that we made a lot of mistakes with this building. He admitted that. Um, the problem was uh, uh, that uh, mm, during two, uh, three weeks uh, during summertime, especially in uh, July, a, a death ray uh, caused by the, the reflective glass uh, uh, on the south facade um, reflect uh, off the glass exterior and melted down part of this Jaguar car. Another uh, images, as we can see on the left, uh, the barber near the skyscraper uh, could uh, also uh, made a, a, a fry hag on his window sill. Uh, the planners have since raised uh, concerns that um, has been built doesn't match the approved plan. Uh, but uh, before it was open, uh, the building, it was found that its south-facing glass facade could channel the sun rays uh, into, the, into the street into a deadly beam of heat capable of uh, do such uh, a fried egg. The architect uh, claims to have identified the problem before during the design stage, but he says that it was without uh, appropriate tools or uh, softwares to analyze the precise effect, and that's what happened. So the concave shape of the skyscraper uh, reflects continuously uh, a large amount of sunbeams um, into these dangerous effects. We have to consider that this skyscraper was also awarded with a lot of prizes. Um, it was awarded with the BREAM Excellent uh, uh, Award. That means that it was extremely uh, energy um, saving. Uh, it was uh, planned with a lot of uh, um, specific design strategies to avoid air conditioning, uh, to um, merge the best of the technologies uh, for that time, uh, to reach a very uh, small amount of energy consumed uh, during all the, the year. But the building was also found to have an embarrassing wind problem uh, basically caused by, once again, uh, the concave um, form of the south facade uh, of the 37-story tower. And this problem also uh, blow, uh, blowed pedestrian into the road, uh, according to the newspapers, to the local newspapers, some food trolleys was, uh, were pushed away during the summer due to the very harmful wind effects uh, at the base of the, of the building. This demonstrates clearly that uh, nevertheless, uh, a specific energy attention uh, was uh, placed during the design phase. Uh, we have to consider all the environmental um, design aspects uh, during the design phase. Uh, after this uh, uh, popular, or we can say unpopular case in London, many, many researchers try to analyze with the different softwares uh, the potentialities uh, and their risk uh, related to the south facade uh, of the skyscraper. We can see here some uh, uh, solar analysis conducted by the use of Ecotech software. Um, as we can see, it was very clear that the, the, uh, the south facade of that building uh, couldn't be um, could be uh, very harmful in terms of uh, uh, shading uh, reflective effects sorry uh, because there were no other buildings that can cast shadows over the south facade it was very let's say 
uh, simple uh, to predict the harmful effect that uh, sky this skyscraper uh, eff effectively uh, present. Um, we can see here in this slide another um, uh, studies uh, was conducted uh, in Italy for uh, the irradiance and um, of the south facade, north and other facade of the buildings. And we can see clearly that the south facade is totally unshaded. And this is why the problem uh, has, uh, has formed. To prevent other situation, other uh, melted uh, like in summer 2014, uh, the architects, uh, the firm was uh, um, was forced to contact these uh, uh, very famous firm uh, like uh, Loises and Hobbehold uh, to uh, install the two-story netted shields to cover the facades of the building, the, the south facade of the building. Uh, that that uh, uh, from this point on uh, was nicknamed Worky Scorchy, while city officials have suspended three parking bays until a more permanent solution can be found. Uh, we can see that this uh, um, louver, this bristle ale, was very effective in shading the harmful uh, sun beams uh, during uh, Ju July. Um, we can see on the top uh, the effect of the uh, sun uh, beams uh, uh, with no uh, sun louvers. And on the bottom, we can see after the installment of the uh, sun louvers how the situation was uh, um, improved. Let's move on. This is the south facade today. Uh, we can see that the uh, basically all the facade and uh, um, was uh, uh, shielded and was uh, uh, covered uh, just to avoid this harmful pro problem. So we uh, we would like to uh, focus your attention of, on this uh, uh, very uh, interesting project. So um, the outdoor comfort and method and instruments in urban design practice. We all know so then how the, the microclimatic approach is absolutely important when designing uh, buildings above all inside in um, existing and um, consolidated urban fabric. So now we're going to see how the two things, the two faces of the same coin, as we said at the beginning, the outdoor comfort and the instruments and method for urban design practice can really um, work together. So uh, moving from these two examples, we can say that modern cities were not designed with climate change in mind. Uh, therefore, urban geometry is... Sorry? Okay, I think we can go on. Otherwise, let, let us know. So, um, urban geometries, surfaces, building materials, building forms, uh, and the building envelopes, uh, yeah, general, were just designed uh, according to functional, uh, energetic, or aesthetic needs, like we uh, saw before in, uh, in London, rather than to respond to climatic needs, climatic changes, or environmental needs uh, on the, of the neighborhoods. Therefore, for us, uh, we, we think basically that it's crucial to develop a more sustainable uh, urban project that will significantly reduce the carbon footprint of cities and uh, can enlarge the vision of a, a more sustainable uh, urban design project. Early stage environmental modeling design are those to analyze and intervene on densely populated and consolidated centers, formulating a methodology that takes care of environmental aspects in regeneration interventions and in new development to overcome the intrinsic absence of specific tools for the preliminary environmental analysis 
and to support designing at the micro-urban scale. So the focus on energy and environmental issues has been shifting uh, today towards the open space between buildings, uh, especially in recent years. We can consider that the simulation of microclimatic behavior uh, is usually performed just from an energetic point of view, according, for, according to a scenario by scenario method, like we said uh, so in, uh, in London. We need to move on, and that's why we are trying to give this presentation to uh, make you focus on you know, very specific uh, uh, aspects. The aim of a climate responsible design project is then to develop a climate conscious and energy efficient design, both at the building and the urban level. This means to, um, to focus and to, to, to work on the following objectives. First of all, the definition of acceptable limits of thermal comfort for different climate zones considering both actively conditioned and passive naturally ventilated buildings and urban spaces. Second, recommend recommendation regarding adequate thermal performance of different buildings components, including windows and facades related to the urban space perception. Third, the definition of key parameters that affect the urban microclimate and recommendations for an urban design which provides outdoor thermal comfort for pedestrians both in summer and winter. That's why we uh, talk about urban climate on different scales. We can consider physical form and composition uh, since physical form alters the surfaces uh, with which the atmosphere interacts and uh, urban activities can alter the nature of the atmosphere by emitting waste, heat and other materials. So the study of urban climates is very important for ensuring a healthy, comfortable, comfortable livable environment, environment for urban dwellers and to prevent the harmful, harmful effects of uh, urbanization uh, on larger scale uh, climates. So um, in uh, at the urban scale, we can consider uh, basically three climate scale that can be applied in uh, every urban areas, the micro, the local and the meso scale. Let's start from the very, the, the larger one. The mesoscale represents an entire city. As architects uh, with uh, uh, focus on environmental issues, it's very hard to concentrate and to uh, work to mitigate the mesoscale. We preferably uh, work at the local scale, but especially we would like to focus on microscale. So the, the local scale we can see in the scheme on the left side represents the urban neighborhoods. That means uh, from the uh, urban canopy layer uh, to the very top of the highest building. But we prefer to work on the micro scale and from now on we can, uh, we try to uh, specify why the micro scale is so effective uh, for um, a sustainable practice. The micro scale includes building, uh, streets, square, gardens and trees. And from now on we are going to focus at that scale. And here it comes the urban morphology and the urban microclimate. Um, just because uh, we can, in this, in this scale, we can work, we can use together the urban morphological instruments together with the natural elements, because the urban microclimate uh, refers directly to local conditions for temperatures, humidity, solar radiation, and wind, because it is affected by earth by wind, by green, by water, and by urban morphology and materials. So it is the scale where we can, as architects, actually work with a, um, an effective uh, analytical and design 
uh, tools and uh, analytical and design uh, solution for the uh, urban environment. So let's try to uh, make a specific focus on uh, every single element, starting from topography and elevation. For our um, effective urban design, we have to consider the topography. That means, uh, for example, uh, we have to consider that the leeward side of a hill can protect from unwanted winds, as we saw before at the Cincinnati campus, as well as a lake can work as a thermal buffer, a thermal regulator. Also, the presence of the trees, shrubbery, uh, grasses can provide shade, uh, but also they are very effective in preventing moisture from evaporating. Uh, other consideration we have to keep in mind is that the permeable surfaces can effectively reduce temperatures through evaporative cooling, like we see in this uh, uh, in this uh, draw. Uh, the permeable surfaces, it's more, more effective than, rather than uh, asphalt or um, other types of uh, uh, urban um, pavements. And permeable surface reduce evaporative cool opportunities. We see the difference on the left hand side between rural areas and urban areas. It is very clear for uh, about talking about the infiltration above ground, for example, how in rural areas we have at least the 50% of infiltration allowed, while in urban areas we go no more the 15% of infiltrations. We see also the difference, very important and very strong, from a 10% of runoff in rural areas against the 55% of runoff in urban areas. So we see how strong can be the difference in um, designing and analyzing with natural elements together with the buildings or with the physical elements made by man. When we consider the topography and elevation, we have to consider the, um, the effects of the wind and the airflow, uh, generally speaking. Airflow closer to the ground uh, is uh, commonly slowed down by the frictional effects of the surfaces uh, that can be pavements, uh, asphalt or uh, other types of pavements. Uh, then we have to consider that R follows the path of least resistance, uh, the so-called Venturi effect is uh, the best example. So wind speeds uh, increases uh, as a cross-sectional area decreases, as we can see in uh, this row. Um, it's very clear, so we have to consider also the presence of the airflow and winds distribution. In this sense, when we are talking about uh, outdoor comfort, that means uh, uh, the, the wellness, uh, the uh, good and pleasant sensation for jewelers, citizens, final users in general, we can uh, use the Lawson wind comfort criteria, as we can see in this chart. Um, the criteria basically um, consider the average wind speed in meter per second, differentiate, differentiating between uh, among different type of use, uh, seated area, pedestrian standing, pedestrian walking, business walking, or roads and parking. As we can see, the average wind speed can be considered pleasant if we uh, um, if we have uh, um, maximum 5.6 meter per second, we can see, uh, we can consider a gentle breeze that fit a uh, seated area like cafes, benches, and so on. If we are in a parking lot, uh, the uh, average wind speed can be uh, much more uh, effective. Uh, we can consider acceptable a maximum level of 11 meter per second because it can be very uh, harmful or uh, not pleasant at all. 
uh, we can see uh, another chart of wind acceptability levels for urban comfort. That means uh, uh, we have to consider the different final use of the area uh, we are going to design. Um, and we have to consider the potential uh, damages or the potential uh, benefits related to the wind presence and the wind uh, average velocity. And so it comes much uh, once again the role of the urban morphology and in its relations with the urban spaces. Because, of course, in low density situations, the wind settles on the ground in open spaces between buildings. Uh, on a medium density, something, help, something else starts happening with flows over buildings and mixing each other. Like in, while in high density situations, flows over buildings with limited exchange can be seen. So we see clearly how, and I think uh, much more since now, the relation between building and open space design is very effective, not just on the uh, outdoor comfort, but start to be very effective even on the indoor comfort and as a whole uh, for the um, urban uh, design, in, for, for the urban design as a, um, as a complex uh, design approach, the complex design method and so on. One of the most relevant questions when we are designing for uh, wind mitigation inside the, the city, especially the existing city, is how an architect can mitigate the wind uh, or air uh, flows in the existing city. Well, we have some instruments, we have some solutions that can be uh, provided to mitigate uh, some harmful situation. Um, we have to consider that uh, uh, some uh, disposition of the urban, um, urban buildings can um, mitigate uh, or can uh, accentuate the uh, role of the wind. In some situation, uh, wind flow, air flow, uh, it's very positive and it's very um, effective uh, also for natural ventilation inside the building, like on, on the right side of the slide, we can say, we can see uh, um, a traditional uh, wind catcher, uh, a wind tower, uh, it's a traditional um, um, solution for uh, cooling down the buildings by natural ventilation. But many things can happen and uh, not all of them are, uh, are nice. Uh, now we see the Venturi effect among buildings. And you see how the, uh, the airflow around structures such as tall and short buildings, streets, and their different combinations. We, we have different uh, examples, we, we, we number, a, we, a, we named A, B, C, a, D. We see these different cases are um, where a strong flow is deflected down by the buildings. Uh, when a calm zone develops between buildings and we see the combination of large buildings with street form canyon seal accelerating air flows. All of them and many others could be designed to uh, underline how at the micro scale and then working on micro climate elements, the wind is one of, one of the most important of them. Of course, we see, we saw um, the role of the architects can be absolutely uh, effective and uh, in, in a good or in a bad way. So as Professor Marito says, uh, wind is one of the most challenging aspects to control, to design and to prevent in, inside the city. Um, differently from what uh, architect Vignoli says for uh, the, the case of a walkie-talkie building, now we have a lot of tools, a lot of instrument uh, to um, detect uh, the potentiality, damage the, pot the potentiality uh, of the wind. And if done right, wind uh, can become an asset for the building. Uh, we can use uh, or install micro wind turbines uh, in the right place, uh, let's say to the rooftop of the main buildings, and they can generate power uh, for the building 
we can optimize the natural wind ventilation inside the buildings, uh, minimizing power uh, consumption inside the building. So the best way by far to deal uh, with the wind in cities is to consider the potential impact uh, in high-rise building or in open space buildings uh, because uh, they are the uh, two most uh, um, complicated cases to, um, to manage inside the city. In many cases, uh, wind coming from the prevailing wind direction can be included uh, in the early design stage uh, in the um, design uh, in the design phase. Uh, by a lot of softwares, uh, we are going to see in the last part of this uh, uh, this webinar. Yes, we see once again how um, very now and go very fast how um, different elements can influence the uh, the wind. You know, we see on the left top how air flows are deflected downwards by elements uh, um, overhanging by the, the facade or the facade or uh, coming up from the from the ground. Um, we can how the form and the um, the shape of buildings can redirect flows to due to the presence of uh, uh, some scattered or some uh, excavation on the on the facade. Uh, we we see the very famous canyon effects that two buildings in a, in a particular position with a particular dimension can can generate, and we also can see and, and I think it is very interesting, interesting how, for example the cubes or in inside of buildings inside narrowing streets can um, produce in a very uh, acceleration of the of the wind flows so all elements belong to architecture that can uh, interact with the uh, with the the, the, the forms and the, the the moving of the of the wind and eventually Let's also consider some nature-based nature solution like uh, trees, uh, the disposition of uh, trees, uh, uh, different kind of, let's say, or uh, simple walls uh, like uh, uh, these dry walls uh, um, with the stones uh, can act like uh, a barrier to mitigate uh, unwanted uh, winds. So let's say these solutions and the mitigation solution are very, um, very large today. We have just to uh, detect previously, let's say in the very early design phase, what are the best solutions uh, for us to, uh, to, to be designed. Moving on in another uh, parameter we have to consider, um, we have now to consider the role of green areas and the uh, thermal mass benefits that uh, green areas can uh, ensure uh, inside uh, urban project. We have to consider from uh, one end the uh, so-called urban canopy layer and on the other hand, the harmful effect uh, we uh, already known as a urban heat island. What is a urban heat island? In a very simple, very, very simple way, we can uh, define it the difference between maximum urban center air temperature and background rural air temperature. Uh, like Professor Marito says before, um, we have to consider the different thermal behavior, the different thermal absor absorption uh, we can, um, we can um, experience in uh, urban dense city um, and in rural areas where the uh, temperature is uh, two uh, or five degrees Celsius lower, especially during uh, summertime, because of the presence of a more uh, permeable surfaces all over. Yes, and we see, so once again, the two scenarios, the, uh, the urban and the, net and the rural one, and we see high, high developed urban areas are characterized basically by the 75% to the 100% of impermeable surface, release less moisture for evapotranspiration respect to the surface coverage of a natural ground, which has less than 10% of the waterproof cover. 
from the image is very, is very, very clear. These features help to achieve higher air and surface temperatures in urban areas compared to green areas. Maybe this um, this scheme can be very helpful to better understand the phenomena. Uh, large concentration of thermal masses with darker or impermeable surfaces, like in dense city, can create urban heat island. We can see here in downtown the local temperature is much it is very it's higher uh, than to the rural uh, surrounding, especially where the uh, green masses are more effective. Urban heat island so varies in times and space as a result of atmospheric condition, uh, location, and urban features. Uh, consider that urban heat island reaches the maximum at few hours after sunset uh, and not uh, at uh, noon, as we um, can consider. And the minimum uh, value of uh, temperature can be registered in the middle of the day. That's because of the presence of uh, uh, thermal masses that can accumulate a lot of uh, uh, radiation during um, daytime period. Another factor that we uh, have to consider, especially in dense, in dense urban area, is the air pollution. Air pollution can result from uh, emissions, particulates, water vapor, and carbon dioxide from industrial, but also from domestic and uh, automobile processes. So urban heat island effect may, uh, may vary uh, depending upon city population, uh, air pollution uh, level, and the presence of heavy industries. Um, air pollution also influences uh, the presence of uh, flux of solar radiation and re-emits the outgoing radiation back to the, uh, to the sky. Clearly, uh, higher urban temperature seriously impacted the electricity demand, the overall energy consumption of the city because of uh, increasing in air conditioning demand, especially in summertime inside buildings. Uh, and so there's a strict link, uh, it's a very close link between urban heat island and the uh, energy demand uh, inside buildings. Uh, this demonstrate that a good environmental urban design project can influence uh, in a very effective way the overall uh, energy consumption inside the city. Uh, when we uh, consider uh, the green area, uh, we have to consider that if we reduce veg vegetation, the, uh, the global mass uh, inside the city, um, the lack of vegetation results into reduced the evaporation uh, potential and that influences the increasing of heat storage uh, in the dense uh, urban um, environment. When we transform uh, vegetation or green area into urban surfaces, that means into impermeable surfaces, uh, we have a blockade of wind turbulence and the air movement. Uh, a clearly example can uh, be seen in, uh, these, uh, uh, in this drawing where the uh, turbulence of wind is basically absent uh, in the, um, uh, at the street level and uh, it increases uh, moving towards the sky. So an example of boundary layer mixing of warmer air uh, caused by increased surfaces uh, roughness, the so-called cityscape, um, can be caused by urban heat island and can be also influenced the long wave radiation at night. That means that we uh, continue, we keep on consuming not only during daytime, but also during nighttime. And that can be a very dangerous uh, condition. Green area, that means uh, uh, shading potential from uh, trees canopy, um, 
have to be used in urban design for uh, shade uh, the south facades of the buildings. We can see on the top uh, of, uh, uh, of this slide, uh, when the summer sun is higher in the sky, uh, the shade on the uh, wall uh, is granted by the presence of these trees. As well, during winter time, when the sun is lower uh, in the sky, uh, the presence of deciduous trees uh, let the sun warm and uh, um, arrive to the uh, building facade um, in a very profitable way. In, that means uh, uh, lowering the energy consumption for uh, air conditioning and for especially for um, thermal conditioning inside the building. And we, we uh, present a, um, a very uh, popular um, tree in a, a very uh, touristic city in, uh, in Italy, in Puglia, uh, we are in Otranto, uh, where these uh, uh, big secular tree offer a very large shadow potential for tourists and for citizens um, that uh, try to um, cool them down thanks to the presence of uh, this large natural sun umbrella. Uh, it looks like a, a man-made uh, system but is a totally natural uh, shading effect. So to conclude the, um, the overview of the potentiality of green area, uh, we would like you to focus on this uh, uh, simple chart where we can see on the left column uh, some of the most effective uh, uh, solution to be used in the urban design practice like cool paving, permeable paving, uh, generally speaking, a cool envelope treatments, the green envelope and so on. Uh, and uh, in the uh, central columns, we can see uh, the air, uh, the cooling down potentialities, uh, uh, let's say the max effect on surface temperature uh, around the spot of application, uh, as well as some uh, basic constraints uh, these solution uh, also ensure. For example, when we talk about cool paving, uh, they are uh, very effective in reducing the thermal storage when, where, uh, when they are applied on the roof, um, the building roofs, but at the same time, uh, they can change in reflectance over time due to accumulation of dirt or uh, for uh, just simple aging. Uh, the same consideration we can say for uh, permeable paving that can be very effective in reducing uh, above um, two uh, degrees Celsius the uh, thermal accumulation where uh, they are uh, used, but at the same time the main constraints are linked by the water supply or the less uh, efficiency in uh, humid climates and so on. Uh, this chart basically uh, indicates that we have to consider all the beneficial effects, but on the other hand, we have to consider uh, some constraints um, that can be declined case by case, scenario by scenario. Once again, as the topic of the, 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 the context to work with architects, and talking about water, for instance, uh, and as we have seen, as, as Professor Gary, Barbara Gary said, and show us uh, right now in the, uh, in, um, the previous slide, uh, the use of water can be very effective from many points of view, because large bodies of water can moderate the local temperature in a very effective way and uh, acting as a thermal mass that can war, uh, works as thermal buffer and uh, heat sink. But even moving water generates air movement. So just one element, but so important elements can be a very important um, tool for the uh, outdoor comfort and not just for the outdoor comfort, but even from the living of a, uh, of a city. Uh, the best option, it's easy to say, uh, would be to um, integrate effectively all these strategies inside the building and outside the buildings. 
Um, this is a simple scheme where we can say the um, close collaboration and the benefits related to the presence of wind flows inside buildings that generate natural ventilation uh, that collaborates with the green uh, facade. And um, that means that every single aspect in uh, microclimatic uh, evaluation has to be considered uh, with relation to the final users, uh, the energy consumption of the buildings we are considering. And uh, the, uh, we have to um, try to m uh, make the best of the potentialities of fountains, uh, mist sprays, uh, like in the very top of these buildings, uh, waterfalls, uh, considering that these specific solution cannot be used in every climate. This is very important. It is very important. It is not by chance that, for instance, in this uh, very famous and very beautiful Palazzo della Ziza in, uh, in Palermo, uh, the use of fountains of mixed sprays and waterfall have been um, applied to increase the evaporation rates in a very dry and hot weather like the Sicilian one. Uh, at the end of these, uh, this review, uh, we have to focus on the role of materials. That means building materials, finishing materials. Um, the uh, reflectivity, the albedo values of uh, surfaces uh, uh, determining the amount of observed short wave radiation depends mainly on the color of the surfaces we are considering and um, is a, a very large variability in urban areas. Uh, for example, uh, we can consider uh, the value between about um, 0.3 for light colors uh, till one uh, for darker colors. Um, to be simple, I albedo materials could be extremely effective in reducing building cooling energy use. Uh, so we have to uh, consider both urban geometry and building finishing materials. Albedo values, uh, uh, we, mm, the most, the, many of us uh, usually work with albedo values when uh, we are trying to um, set up a, uh, a, also a simple case of uh, um, rendering solutions uh, when we have to uh, select between materials and uh, is reflectivity or microsurfaces or albedo values. Uh, many softwares present a uh, uh, images similar to this one, uh, we have to uh, focus on also the albedo values as a potential mean, a potential lever, lever to control uh, urban eight island effects. Um, this is, these are uh, some examples, some uh, pictures um, shot in, uh, uh, in a typical Italian city. I think is, is Rome, uh, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, on the left side, on the left column, we can see the uh, thermal uh, camera pictures. Uh, and on the right side here, uh, the, the, st the standard pictures, we can see, we can see clearly uh, how different colors and different permeable surfaces, uh, that means different stones uh, or asphalts or the presence of uh, trees, uh, can affect their local temperature. Uh, the red purple color indicates uh, uh, a lower temperature, as well as the uh, yellow color, orange ones, uh, indicates a, uh, a very high temperature. We can see, we can clearly see, uh, for example, here the presence of the green masses can be very effective in reducing the local temperature. Uh, it's the basic, it's the basic uh, of uh, urban heat island effect. Uh, here, uh, the graphs indicate the uh, thermal profile during daytime when the temperature are very high uh, with the, uh, a strong correlation with the presence of uh, impermeable surfaces like in downtown. But 
let's see here what happens the presence of a pond with a, uh, let's say a, a um, water mass a water buffer can offer a, a very effective uh, decrease in daytime temperature during nighttime the uh, the graph is exactly the opposite because where, where uh, the temperature is lower during daytime, during nighttime, uh, the pond, the water uh, reflect and uh, leave to the, uh, the sky all the uh, heat uh, that has uh, uh, been stored during daytime. That's why we have this peak here in, uh, in uh, the pond. So now let's go to the uh, last part of our presentation, uh, very important because it, it, is, it refers to the climate-based urban design um, in the early stage environmental modeling, because uh, as, uh, uh, as we know, um, as early as possible, we intervene on, uh, on, on designing and uh, from environmental point of view, but even from morphological point of view, as much as we can be effective um, at the um, at the bottom of the process. So, several studies prove that climate change in urban areas is about twice higher than the rural areas that we've been seeing in the, in the slides before. This has also an increasing influence on the health of the residents. Moreover, the need for cooling demand of the buildings will increase, which in turn will require higher energy demand of the building sector. These changing conditions uh, will influence, uh, have been influenced planning uh, and architects uh, uh, in the building sector towards a uh, so-called climate-based urban design. Um, so we, um, Professor Marito and I, uh, have been working on this uh, topic um, about climate-based design for enhanced outdoor comfort, that means uh, we have been focusing at the new urban scale for decarbonizing cities, and this scale is the neighborhood, the present scale, where, have be, where uh, we have been applying the early stage environmental modeling for, for years. So we would like to present you a short review of the main parameters uh, we have also uh, uh, saw before uh, to be considered in the early stage urban uh, modeling. On the left side, we can see the microclimatic elements like solar radiation, the orientation, the presence of wind, the presence of uh, uh, shadows uh, uh, elements, the vegetation and water bodies. Uh, as Professor Marito has already said, uh, the urban morphology uh, plays a, a relevant role. Uh, consider the urban net, urban density, building height, the green mass, water bodies. And at the end of this uh, evaluation, we can also consider and develop some um, profitable strategies to be applied at the building envelopes. Uh, that means uh, uh, building uh, components, building elements, building overhang, and so on. In the last years, uh, we have uh, tried to um, make order, <laughs> let's say, uh, among a very large variety of tools and software uh, in order to uh, better understand which ones are the more uh, convenient for us to be applied in the early, er early stage urban design. Um, we try to collect the um, many, many data about the modeling condition, the shadow range, the light simulation, and overall the potentialities of uh, uh, many different uh, softwares we are going to present to you. But lastly, we are trying to move from the uh, theory to practice. Yes, and to do this, we focus on, uh, let's say, uh, five conceptual, but even operative points, plus one, that is a sixth, of course. And uh, as we see before, this sort of synthesis for a methodology include the wind analysis, uh, solar radiation analysis, the shadow range, the material um, and thermal property, property assessment, and of course, the outdoor comfort assessment. 
all these elements um, in our methodology are uh, interpreted, analyzed, shared, and um, put together in order to define targets around which to uh, organize and structure our design methodology, changing context, changing the microclimatic situation, and changing the needs for which the design process were, were, was uh, asked by commitments. First of all, uh, we would like to present some uh, data, some outputs we uh, collected these uh, last years for uh, wind analysis, especially for airflow analysis. We can see different outputs uh, related to uh, Envimet, Ecotect and uh, Revit. All these instruments can offer uh, a large variety of instruments to assess the potentiality of wind uh, flux, fluxes uh, among buildings uh, related to wind direction and wind temperature. These instruments can also be um, applied to evaluate the relationship uh, between inside and outside uh, buildings. That means uh, we can uh, use our uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, assessment tools. Um, the same uh, analysis can be conducted for uh, a large um, pricing scale, that means to perform a bulk analysis of the airflow to predict natural ventilation effects, uh, the relationship to the internal temperature uh, inside and outside, outside comfort levels for, uh, for users. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, the other parameter uh, that we have to consider is the solar analysis. Uh, here, the sun energy on a surface is, uh, has to be strictly considered to avoid phenomena like uh, the one we uh, saw before in London. Um, Many, many instruments, many software offers uh, uh, different types of uh, evaluation uh, that can be seen in graphs, uh, charts, uh, or 3D models, uh, according to the user preferences. Uh, shadow range and solar gain, it's very uh, also relevant uh, topic, right, Marco? Yes, yes, they're absolutely very, very, very relevant, even because they are uh, directly connected uh, and they of course uh, are very um, how to say uh, related to the uh, architectural and urban choices because a shadow range analysis can be used to quickly determine areas that are typically shaded during a portion of the year and it is very important because for the project uh, for the, the case study you can see on this line, for instance, uh, we see in orange the entire south building that is, shadow, it, it is in shadows for much of the spring, while during summer most of the outdoor areas around the buildings are not shielded from the sun. And it is very impressive and very uh, important from an environmental urban design point of view. So we have to um, connect the, the shadow range with the solar gain uh, we can collect uh, in the uh, um, building facades. Uh, this can be also applied at the uh, neighborhood scale, consider not also the pavements, but also the roof plan with their annual uh, solar irradiation uh, levels. Yes, and using, for instance, uh, uh, the, the possibility of the interactive 3D sound pass diagram and uh, that we can have in uh, Revit or in Vasari or, in, uh, or Ecotech or even in Google SketchUp is very easy and very um, useful to visualize shadows based on the sound positions. And it is a very useful tool for architects to immediately go through the environmental uh, analysis and then later on design. And eventually uh, the material finishing, the material thermal property assessment, it's also very relevant uh, to better focus on the most appropriate choice uh, to our squares, uh, open spaces and building facades. 
here we can see uh, some uh, example uh, related to some project we uh, we carried out um, here uh, a simple chart where we can find out what are the most effective and most dangerous let's say uh, albedo values for finishing materials yes and so the outdoor comfort assessment that is the uh, the, the fifth point we've been uh, talking about uh, the outdoor thermal environment is greatly influenced by the build environment uh, an example the anthropogenetic heat the evaporization and evapotranspiration of plants the shedding by trees and the man-made objects and the ground surface cover such as natural grass and artificial paving and so on are all elements directly influencing the comfort, uh, out, the outdoor comfort. Outdoor spaces uh, so provide a, a pleasant thermal comfort experience for people, for citizens, uh, and can effectively improve the quality of urban living. So when uh, we uh, talk about people experience different thermal sensation, we have to carry out a uh, evaluation of outdoor thermal comfort in uh, streets, plazas, playgrounds, urban parks. And to do this, we have some specific uh, outdoor comfort uh, parameters that we can, say, uh, can see here. Uh, mm, moving from hot situation to cold situation, we can uh, distinguish basically on three outdoor thermal comfort. The most effective one uh, is lately considered the PET, physiological equivalent temperature, um, going very fast uh, in this definition, this PET is defined as the uh, equivalent air temperature at which in a typical indoor condition, heat balance of the human body exists. Um, moving on, we uh, can also use uh, the so-called predicted me both PMV, defined by Fanger in 1972. Uh, it was originally developed to be used in indoor uh, environments, but lately uh, has uh, uh, been frequently applied also in outdoor studies. And uh, the, the last one is the uh, so-called Universal Thermal Climate Index, UTCI. Uh, it was uh, recently developed in 2002 and provides an assessment of the outdoor thermal environment by considering all the parameters seen so far, that means uh, solar gains, solar uh, shading, uh, wind potentialities, and so on. So, what tools for climate-based urban design? <laughs> <laughs> the digital tools, of course, are uh, already the primary vehicle for developing design concept and for producing architecture. They have also recently become a vehicle for interdisciplinary collaboration, which has introduced a multitude of new tools which bridge sectors of knowledge, uh, originally very from, far from each other, that have been traditionally fragmented, but that thanks to these new tools can be worked together, I would say, once again. Uh, very, going very fast, uh, the um, so-called performative design use the uh, ESTS, so the environmental simulation tools, that is very, they are very important, as we all know. They, uh, they all uh, come from the book of the old JCC. Um, uh, he, for the first time, he start uh, thinking and representing a microclimatic uh, analysis in order to adapt massive design, passive design choices to local climate needs. So moving from this traditional uh, book, we, we try to define the capabilities of the, um, a large variety of tools um, today um, available for urban designers and architects. Yes, the, of course, the, today almost every building is designed with the use the, of the ESTS, or the Environmental Simulation Tools. Uh, any kind any kind of architecture we are going to design, we may use of these tools. Um, sustainability and its implementation uh, of simulation, simulation tools, oftentimes called performative design, 
appear to have changed not only then the shape of buildings, but also the shape of architectural practice and design methods. In order to give you a very quick overview of the uh, tools we currently uh, use in, uh, in our practice, uh, we would like to present the Grasshopper instrument. It's a parametric, parametric interface design both for geometric modeling and a software development platform. Uh, the most useful instrument it offers is the Ladybug tools. Um, it's a, a it's a very effective, uh, uh, let's say, especially for a climatic uh, environmental analysis for solar access uh, to analyze the solar envelope, uh, the radiation st studies, and so on. Um, another plugin um, considered in Grasshopper is the Onibi uh, that basically consider the uh, daylighting uh, advantages, uh, eating energy usage, energy shade benefits. And lastly, uh, butterfly and dragonfly application, uh, consider the wind flow uh, indoor and in outdoor. And the dragonfly, uh, it's very interesting uh, from our point of view because consider the urban heat island uh, condition uh, also via uh, thermal satellite images. Yes, going so going very far. MVMAP is uh, uh, it's a three-dimensional microclimate model designed to simulate the surface plant-air interaction in urban environment, and um, it is maybe at the moment the most important and most effective tool soft and software in order to um, uh, to, to to organize an uh, urban environmental design. Uh, I would go very fast in this yeah. case, Barbara, we, yes. We currently use this uh, instrument to perform a different kind of evaluation, especially for, um, in order to focus on urban thermal indexes like so before, PMV, PAT, UTCI, and so on. These are uh, some uh, da data uh, collected from uh, our um, simulation. And let's go to the very last. Yes. Uh, uh, very last, but not least, this Revit. <laughs> you know, that he is, as we all know, a very important BIM, so a building information modeling. And it is useful because uh, um, offers uh, integrated energy analysis workflows that make easier for the building designers, for the urban designer, above all, to simulate and improve. That is very important the um, energy performance of building and uh, urban uh, context. Um, at the end, uh, please consider also uh, the potentiality of uh, uh, the new uh, Google SketchUp, uh, that it's very effective in considering a thermal mass airflow strategies and energy consumption uh, in, the, in the last release. Uh, uh, we found it very effective and very profitable uh, to urban design too. So let's move oh, to the conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> let's move to the conclusion. Uh, we see that the, we have tools, very, very sophisticated tools in order to make urban design and environmental analysis and, and so environmental design. We have uh, uh, a common sharing of knowledge from the uh, urban side to the environmental side uh, or sustainable side. So I think that we are at a time in which finally different field of knowledge, uh, thanks to common instruments in uh, uh, design, any kind of design, can really come back to a, a, a organic, effective and uh, even very dynamic um, uh, urban and environmental design strategy for the city of the 21st century. This is one of the target, of course, of Kaibup, as we all know, the Knowledge Alliance for Evidence-Based Urban Practice. So, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> We are at the end. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Marco and uh, Barbara. Uh, we have some uh, time left uh, for questions and comments from our students and uh, the guests. Um, 
uh, it was very interesting, let me say, and I think in the context of our project of kebab, uh, I think the lecture gave us a lot of insight and a lot of details on how your analysis relates to design. Um, uh, it made that link uh, very clear, uh, both at the architectural level and uh, at the landscape uh, level. So it, I think it, it was very um, important. Uh, it, it was very relevant uh, to the project. Um, are there any questions uh, or comments from the audience uh, to start with? You can put your camera on and speak, or you can uh, write uh, your question or comment uh, in the chat, and I will uh, read it out. So. Let me start with a question, comment, uh, while the rest uh, still think uh, a little bit. Um, I'll take you back to the very beginning uh, of your lecture, to the Cincinnati uh, project, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and I was wondering um, a, a couple of things uh, that maybe you can give us a few more details about the project. I don't know if, if you know the um, answer to this. Uh, I wasn't quite sure whether you were directly involved with the project or whether it was, uh, it's just a study. Um, but um, the, the first thing that I was wondering was how did that project uh, come about? So, um, in the context of kebab as well, where we also look at the interaction between practice uh, and research and in, in terms of how it really works in, in professional practice. Uh, uh, was it commissioned by the university itself? Was the brief to do an environmental assessment? Um, the idea of the university, if it was the university who was commissioned, who commissioned to do it. And you, you said there was a campus life study, uh, which I assume happened before the redesign or to inform the redesign. And I was wondering whether there was a post-occupancy evaluation assessment after the redesign uh, to see how the performance changed. I, I don't know if you have any more information about that. Well, I, I, Barbara, if you agree, I answer to the first part of the question, then you yeah. finish to the, to the second. But first of all, we were not involved in the design process. It is just a study uh, we made on the, on, the, on the campus, but we have been in Cincinnati before and after. And um, it was very interesting because the topic was to, it was a sort of a regenerative project. I mean, the campus was already there, it was very fragmented, it was very dispersed. I remember the first time I was, I was there, the sensation wasn't very nice at all. The open spaces, apart from few gardens, were of a, a sort of a very functional uh, uh, um, uh, urban organization. I mean, blocks put all together in a very chaotic way, according to different times, uh, connected by roads. Um, so uh, what the uh, Hargraves and Associate done, and I would like to remind that they are the firm that uh, work on the uh, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in London, uh, after the, uh, actually before and after the Olympic Games, and uh, was to reconnect all these spaces from a functional point of view. Don't forget that all these roads are elements of connection between, between buildings and then between the different functions. There are very important elements in the life of the campus and in the life of the open space of the campus. The, commit, the commitment was for, from the university, if I'm not wrong. And since the beginning, there was an environmental intention. Actually, it was one of the goal, one of the topic of the uh, uh, design uh, process. Uh, so I don't know, actually, Barbara, maybe you know it better than me, if there have been an, an evaluation after the, uh, the, the project. But for sure, the in commitment was to 
reorganized from an, um, let's say, morphological, uh, f physical, and then um, environmental point of view, the, uh, the university campus. And what I can say is that actually it works. I mean, there are still some problems in my personal opinions, but at the end of the day, we could say uh, that after the Hargraves uh, work, we finally have a campus. <laughs> it, it is a bit strong, but I would say like this. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a, a post-occupancy evaluation uh, on the outdoor uh, areas. But how Marcus says before, um, the environmental studies, the environmental evaluation that consider wind, solar gains, uh, the green masses, uh, permeable and impermeable surfaces, uh, became the the very uh, the main goal, uh, the main instrument that informs all the projects, and that it's very um, innovative uh, point of view uh, to to design uh, a very large uh, urban campus like the the one in Cincinnati because the. Um, the target of the project was uh, to ensure a great livability for, uh, for students and faculty members, uh, uh, basically by using natural-based solution, because as we can say, uh, see before, uh, there were no uh, specific or technological aspects uh, used uh, to perform these, uh, um, these kinds of uh, um, evaluation. Um, it's, it's very smart, it's very effective with, in a very simple way, let's say. Uh, and this is very interesting from our point of view. That's why we usually present it, it, it as a case. It's a, a good case. Uh, and and on, the, on the other side, uh, there's the case of uh, uh, walkie-talkie buildings. Uh, that it's also very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, so let's see if there are any further questions or comments from the audience. Wasn't seems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would like to thank you for your lecture. I would like to ask you in regards to the simulations that you made, have you also regarded um, the GIS? Have you made also a GIS simulation related to BIM? Because GIS is related to the geographic information system. So it's very related to what your lecture is about. So I'm just wondering if you have used that. Kind of tools that make analysis of GIS? Yes, uh, we have been using and we use GIS in our uh, research project and also uh, in, the, in some competition project. I, rem I remember Barbara, the project for the seven squares in historical center of Viterbo, where we use a GIS right to uh, put all the elements together. That means GIS is very important because it works for in our methodology as a sort of a table on which we can put uh, analytical aspects and design uh, answer to the to the to the local uh, local needs. Actually, we are using now even in Venice, we are, um, there is a res an ongoing research on the urban fabric of Venice, and the GIS is a very important tool because, is, as you said, is right the elements of the connection between analy analysis and synthesis, which is uh, between data and uh, design aspects of the, of the process. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is a comment and question uh, in the chat, um, which is, uh, are, we, are we ready out? Uh, at some point, Patrick Blanc, the man who first proposed and constructed vertical walls as a uh, mimesis of natural function, said, I knew that my life would revolve, would revolve around these confrontations between free living beings and my own life as a human being bound to city life. I never liked uh, countryside and never liked gardens. Except, of course, botanical gardens. I enjoyed only cities, big cities, and the most undisturbed natural habitat. 
Do you believe in such a strict relationship between cities with, for example, only artificial green installations such as green walls and roofs and then disturb the natural habitat could be a solution for our planet? Uh, could such view um, create, I guess that means create in human beings a more distinguishable uh, sense for the needs of city and nature? So I guess it's a kind of a philosophical questions and I've seen other, I've heard other architects making the statement about only liking city or undisturbed nature, um, but it does uh, raise the issue of how that view relates to design. <laughs> Well, I, I would answer with two, two, um, two, two sentences. The first one is uh, we, we have to remind what the um, American landscaper J.B. Jackson used to say around the, 50, the 50s of the 20th century, that city and countryside are part of the same landscape. And I think it is very important because this connection between city and the uh, countryside is... Uh, absolutely um, effective in a 21st century city design. So um, I don't believe we, we have to face this, um, let's say, this uh, uh, contrast between city and countryside. It is a very modern concept. So it comes from the modernity ideas of man and nature, like two opposite elements in the, you know, in the world. It is not like this. And, uh, and a, a very resilient and effective example is uh, once again London. If we think about the fantastic uh, square systems in London where these small gardens are just a piece of nature within the, the urban fabric, but they cannot exist without the, the presence of the building envelope. Actually, an urban, a, a London square is something that put together nature uh, real estate market, architects, landscaper, botan botan botanists, and so on. So they're a very typical example of what man in a very urban fabric, so in a very uh, artificial situation, can produce. So I think uh, uh, and we believe that uh, the solution is, uh, um, once again, of a sharing uh, it is not to, we are, we are not against the city. I love city. I would never live in countryside. I want to live in cities like the, our, well, like the, 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 the question says. Uh, but at the same time, uh, green elements are and can be part of a city, but not without, without considering them like artificial um, tools to be placed on buildings or wherever but just like because in a very urban environmental design we have many tools uh, to to be used we have the morphological the architectural we have even the natural one like wind sun uh, water and so on uh, so i think if barbara agree with me i think it is it, that could be our our point of view we have a, a number of uh, let's say a very rich toolkit for urban design and in which the natural elements are part of it, but within their own identity role, identitarian role. I don't know if we I have we have answered to the question, Barbara. You're muted, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with you, Marco. Uh, I think, and let's say uh, I, I talk like a, an architectural engineer. Um, the, the so-called natural-based solution could be the most effective uh, solution to be applied in the city and not to merge uh, city and countryside. That, that's not the point. It's not useful. We, we don't want to do so. Uh, but can be uh, the most effective one, and they are clearly uh, demonstrated to be effective and profitable solutions, um, to uh, get the, the, the a smart solution uh, resumed and moved from, uh, let's say, countryside, natural world, uh, and, and uh, uh, traditional vernacular experience, uh, and we make the most of them. Uh, we don't need to merge uh, or uh, make some confusion uh, between cityscape and uh, urbanscape. The, we don't need to. Uh, so I basically agree with the, the Marco point of view. Thank you very much. I think that was a 
very interesting uh, final discussion. Uh, I'm going to take the session to an end because we need a short break before uh, the next one. If anyone has any further comments or questions, perhaps uh, you can get in touch with the project Kebab. Or you can find us on the many social media and you can forward the comments and questions to the today's speaker. Also. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, the session will remain open. Uh, the next webinar starts at uh, 1 p.m. Central European time on the same link. So uh, I hope to see uh, some of you there. Uh, and I will stop recording. Uh, thank you. Uh, goodbye. Thank you.